This video is brought to you by Skillshare. When you have a TV show all about time travel, it's inevitable that your characters will eventually find themselves in a situation where they arrive in a very dark period of history. Some great tragedy they can't change. I have a sneaking suspicion this fire should be allowed to run its course. Quite remarkably, besides Series 1's Father's Day, this kind of problem didn't appear in the first three series of the revived run of Doctor Who. However, showrunner Russell T Davies had developed a fascination with Pompeii, and the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, which destroyed the ancient Roman city. Initially, he wanted to write a story about Pompeii for Series 1, where it would turn out that the Ninth Doctor has been grooming Rose to be the perfect companion. However, this story was replaced with Boomtown, which was probably a wise idea. When Series 4 was being written, the first historical episode was due to be a story about Nazis written by Mark Gatiss, although this was dropped because Davies thought it was too soon to revisit World War II after the Empty Child two-parter. To replace the story, Davies decided to work with up-and-coming sci-fi writer James Moran to develop a story about the Doctor being faced with the dilemma of stopping Pompeii, which eventually became The Fires of Pompeii. Moran had impressed Davies with his tortured episode Sleeper, and Davies wanted a writer who wouldn't mind him having significant input to finish up and polish the script into its final form. Despite having mixed reviews when it aired on the 12th of April 2008, The Fires of Pompeii has since become a massive fan favourite for its exploration of this huge dilemma. But does it hold up to this day? And does it really deserve to be called Modern Art? But first, do you want to know how you can make modern art? Well, I can tell you with a single word, Skillshare. You've probably heard about Skillshare before, but you may be wondering what the fuss is all about. Well, look at it like this. Want to paint an epic picture of the Doctor and Donna surfboarding down Mount Vesuvius? Thinking of getting into creative writing to continue the tale of Cochilius and his family? Well, Skillshare is the place for you. Skillshare is a great online learning community that lets creative people come together to explore new skills, or even expand their knowledge in their existing passions. There are thousands of classes in all kinds of areas for you to explore, like video editing, creative writing and filmmaking. The variety is just wonderful, with so many opportunities for you to express yourself and achieve real personal and professional growth. Skillshare introduces you to a community of millions, helping you create real projects with other people's support. It's designed specifically for learning, so there's no need to worry about ads and there's a constant flow of new premium classes and Skillshare originals being launched all the time. I would recommend low budget filmmaking, tips and tricks for an indie look by Matty Brown. I've always wanted to be a filmmaker, but it's easy to find yourself demotivated because films are hard to make. However, this is a great, encouraging class which helps you harness your creativity with unconventional techniques to create experimental projects. It's really helpful if you want to get into filmmaking without a big budget, because it lets you get the best out of what you have. You can access this class along with thousands of others right now by joining Skillshare for less than $10 a month with an annual subscription. And look, just between you and me, the first 1,000 people to click the link in my description will get a free trial of Skillshare Premium Membership. I mean, it's literally free, so why not try it out for yourself and see what you think? If you've spent any time on the internet recently, you'll know we're in unprecedented times, with a lot of important conversations happening right now. Your voice is more important than ever, and Skillshare can help you turn your creativity into social good. So again, a big thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Now, back to the review. To start, a lot of the episode was filmed on location in an Italian film studio, and it really shows. It's a set used for historical films, and really lends a sense of realism and authenticity to the setting. In Series 3, they had to use a lot of green screening and camera tricks to make it seem like the Doctor and Martha were in New York, but here they don't need to do that, because this was the first time the modern show properly filmed abroad, so it can revel in the authenticity of the ancient Roman setting. Like Donna says, I feel like the set design deserves a lot of plaudits because it realises the setting so successfully, making you feel this vibrant, living city with the interiors all also looking very authentic. It creates such a good vibe for the episode, which I feel is kind of underlooked because of the strong writing overshadowing it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much. That is a wrap for this evening. That's a wrap in Rome. Thank you all. 
It's also nice that Donna notices signs in English rather than Latin, initially thinking the Doctor is pranking her by taking her to Epcot, but it's just the effect of the TARDIS translation circuits. This translation circuit is always an important thing to get out of the way when it comes to a new companion's first trip, since the audience will always think, hang on a minute, how come they can talk to people who can't speak English? You have to address it every couple of series just to explain these things to new viewers, so I like that it's quickly dealt with here, including a cheeky nod to the age old question of what if you actually do speak in that language? Touches like these are why I appreciate writers who are Doctor Who fans. They'll have been in discussions with other fans and thought about this exact concept. It's a problem only Doctor Who fans would ever think about because we love to overanalyze and pick holes into the show. For such a short moment, it answers two big questions about communication in historical settings, so I think it's a good way of using the first trip format to establish important rules and have a little bit of fun, especially because we get a reference to the first Doctor serial, The Romans, in which the Doctor inspires Nero big insurance fraud fire. Again, you would only get stuff like this from fans, because it's quite the deep cut to reference such an old and mostly ignored story. Uh oh, someone will probably be upset I said that. During the cold open, the Doctor and Donna believe they're in Rome itself, since that's where they're expected to go, only for them to notice a giant mountain. You don't have to be a history buff to know what that means, because we all know what an ancient Roman city with a massive mountain means. I love the realisation as the Doctor works out there in Pompeii the day that Vesuvius erupts. This is one of the worst places for a time traveller to go, because it's the destruction of a civilization, one of the biggest human tragedies on record. It's one thing to fly about the universe getting into scraps with space riders on the moon or sentient fat, but it's another thing to find yourself in Pompeii the day it gets destroyed by a volcano. It's a fantastic revelation to kickstart the episode, going from bad to worse so quickly and dramatically, because you immediately understand the significance of them being here, how dangerous their presence is and that they need to get out of there straight away, because they can't get involved and don't want to die themselves. Much like the translation circuit, another problem Doctor Who stories face is the presence of the TARDIS itself. The first thing the audience will want to ask in a situation like this is, why don't they just get in the TARDIS and leave? People are right to think that, because the Doctor has just found out they're in Pompeii as it's about to get obliterated. There's no reason to hang around, so within the first five minutes they should have just hopped back into the TARDIS, flown away and gone to free some mood. Roll credits. It's up to the writer to rationalise why that doesn't happen, and James Moran does that in a good way. I've spoken before about episodes like The Impossible Planet and Voyage of the Damned writing the TARDIS out to force the Doctor to stay, and this is another good example of that. If you take the TARDIS away, there's no longer that massive plot hole, no more easy escape, because the Doctor now has to go and find it. This time it turns out the TARDIS has been sold to good old PCAP over here as Cacilius, who believes it's modern art. I love the establishment of Cacilius and his family. First of all, there's that great scene of them all rushing to protect valuables from the volcanic tremors, desperate to stop things from smashing because they want to gain status through wealth, just like anyone else through history. Indeed, this scene is great because it gives the family a lot of modern parallels, such as Quinta staying out too late to drink and mingle with people his family disapprove of, him being a lazy and layabout teenager. I think it's a good touch to draw these parallels because it makes them relatable characters, even though they're from thousands of years ago, they act similarly to us in the modern day. There are so many things that have stayed constant over the years, so it helps people relate to these characters by creating common ground and showing these modern problems, along with a scene showing how commonplace these tremors are because they have their own designated positions to stop things being destroyed. It's no different from people having earthquake shelters or fire drills. They expect this stuff to happen because it's so frequent, so they have their own plans for when it does. It's then established that Evelina is a so-called seer. She has the ability to look into the smoke and gain visions, which adds a very mystical note to everything, but it also keeps the story very entrenched into the Roman setting. Yeah, Romans love their wine, gladiatorial combat and feeding Christians to lions, but they were massively into their gods, most of whom were literally just stolen from the Greeks because of immigration and invasion. Because the Roman Empire was such a dominant force for so long, their beliefs and mythology became ingrained within the world as a whole. Like the other ancient civilizations, they had gods for everything, and gods were always the answer. Lost some money betting at the Colosseum? Fortuna did that. Need to win a battle? Pray to Minerva and your strategies will win the day. Get an STD from the brothel? You upset either Venus or Juno and they cursed you for your sins. Mythology is the core of this episode, and it really shows, with 
Achilles making Quintus pray to the household gods, and the Poundland Sisterhood of Khan believing in their smoke and visions. It creates a very strong backbone which stays true to the views of the time, since they were advanced enough to create this sprawling civilization, but also uninformed and naive enough to believe that every aspect of their lives was controlled by a pantheon of gods. And of course, because it's Doctor Who, it was all because of aliens. Then Lucius arrives and gets into a proverb battle with the Doctor, trading wisdom to one-up each other because the Doctor can never resist an opportunity to flex his intelligence. It's a good little moment before he and Donna try to leave, only to see part of a motherboard, which, you know, doesn't really belong in ancient Rome unless you're playing a modded paradox game or some wild civilization campaign. It's another way of keeping the Doctor in Pompeii. They have the TARDIS now, but this new thing comes up in order to ground them, because the Doctor knows something is wrong if there's a big square circuit sitting in a villa in 79 AD. To further show the spooky goings on, Evelina comes out and starts to speak truths about the Doctor and Donna, talking about who they are and where they come from. This scene is absolutely incredible and it gave me a genuine shiver down my spine when I I watched this episode for this video. As the Earth rumbles beneath their feet, Evelina and Lucius take turns revealing knowledge about the Doctor and Donna, name dropping Gallifrey, saying he's a Lord of Time, and hinting towards Rose's return, along with Donna having the Time Beetle on her back and mentioning the Medusa Cascade. It's such a phenomenal scene as the Doctor gets more and more uncomfortable at these truths, this knowledge of him that's impossible to have. They're looking into his and Donna's very souls, and I love how David Tennant performs this moment, the Doctor going from interested to shocked and scared as they keep talking. It's very significant for showing just how wrong everything is here. This shouldn't be possible, but here these two oracles are, knowing so much about him because of these strange abilities. I think it's a better executed version of her dying in battle moment in the Satan Pit, where the Beast predicted Rose's fate and taunted her with it. This is very similar to that, but the constant rumbling and swelling music adds so much weight and emotion to the moment, and shows that the oracles really do have these powers. It's not the usual fakery that psychics and oracles deploy to scam people. This sudden truth is addressed by Cacilius, who admits that the soothsayers used to be imprecise until there was a massive earthquake, and then they suddenly started speaking the true true. I speak the true. True. It lends a lot of credence to the mysterious goings on because there is a clear moment where things suddenly changed and shifted the reality of the soothsayers, how they can predict absolutely everything with exact precision by consuming the smoke, which has tiny rock particles from the mountain itself. It creates that direct link between Vesuvius and the soothsayers, how that is responsible for the seismic shift in the Oracle's predictions, so the Doctor knows all roads lead to Vesuvius. It's the heart of Vesuvius. We're right inside the mountain. The Doctor and Quintus then sneak into Lucius' house to look at the mysterious circuit board being assembled, finding out it's actually an energy converter. He knows that Lucius didn't come up with these designs because he knows it's impossible for this technology to exist. It's like going back to see King Arthur and he's walking around wearing airpods, jamming out to booty jams. It doesn't take a genius to know there's outside interference, because this technology is so far from these people's comprehension that it's impossible for them to develop this kind of tech naturally. This is a time where they still believe in all these gods, but Lucius just has a big motherboard like he's about to build a new gaming PC to play Total War Rome. It's clear to everyone that he's under someone else's guidance, and as the audience we know that the ancient Roman gods aren't real, so they're not the ones influencing him, it's something else. It's very Doctor Who to do this, showing that the monsters of the episode are manipulating the naive human characters like pawns in a grander scheme. Then we get a glimpse of these monsters as Lucius summons something to chase the Doctor and Quintus, a giant monster made of fire and stone appearing in the villa. I love that initially people think it's a god, since they have this limited understanding of these kinds of entities, but it flamethrowers one of the house servants to show how dangerous it is and that it's not got good intentions for the Doctor. I really like the design of the pyrovile soldier. It has quite a Greco-Roman look to it, mainly because of the helmet shape of its head. It really looks imposing and powerful, looming over everyone in the villa. Even though it's quickly defeated with some buckets of water, it creates a sense of the wider threat because this is just a foot soldier. God knows what the big boss is like. CGI in the Davies era was always a bit spotty, but I think the pyrovials are an example of it working very well to realise the more abstract aliens of the show. Since it comes to life quite well, the mix of magma and rock looking like a really fresh and unique design for the show. Earlier in the episode, Karen Gillan got lost on her way to Day of the Dead celebrations, eventually arriving in a smoky chamber full of other people in the same makeup and robes, having foretold the arrival of the TARDIS. 
This is apparently the Sibylline Sisterhood, and again, the set design of the temple looks great, once again encapsulating that idea of Roman mythology and religion. When Donna tries to convince Evelina to take her family and escape the city, the sisters listen in and overhear this new prophecy about the destruction of Pompeii, which contradicts their high priestess's prophecy of Pompeii rising and becoming an empire. This is a good way to get Donna and the sisters involved in the main story, because Donna's simple act of trying to save one family has already caused repercussions those being the sisters labelling her a false prophet. The Doctor and Donna have different paths to walk during this story, and this is hers, facing the consequences of trying to help, only to get tied up in the events herself. And if you thought this story about mythology and ancient religion needed a bit more human sacrifice, you'd be in luck, as Donna gets kidnapped and tied to a table, about to be sacrificed by the sisters for her so-called false prophecy. This kind of plot development is quite cliche for Doctor Who, happening in episodes like The Mask of Mandragora, where Sarah Jane gets kidnapped and is about to get sacrificed. Wait, Sarah Jane getting kidnapped? Wow, what a shocking turn of events. However, instead of the typical screaming for the Doctor, Donna just shouts at the sisters, which is a very strong way of showing her characterisation and spirit. She's a different type of companion, one who stands on her own two feet and is very outspoken, always putting up a fight no matter the situation. This is good for showing how these character traits can be useful, because she inadvertently delays the sacrifice for the Doctor to save her. She wasn't intentionally doing it to stall, but she was being so difficult that it kept her alive, so it's a good use for her characteristics. You might have eyes on the back of your hands, but you'll have eyes in the back of your head by the time I finish with you! Let me go! If you're familiar with these videos, you'll know I love it when the Doctor recognises monsters and aliens, since it's always good for showing how world-weary and experienced the character is after all these years of travelling. We had it with things like the Ragnos and the Jadun before, but the concept comes up again as he confronts the sisterhood on how their founder Sybil would be ashamed of what her religion has become, because he personally knew her and she even wanted to bonk him. It gives him that long history, meeting so many people and influencing so many lives along the way. The Doctor is a very old character and they've met so many people, so their familiarity with this religion makes a lot of sense and helps guide the story along, because he talks to the High Priestess, who is suffering from a serious case of grayscale over there. Maybe chuck her in the High Tower with Sam and get that sorted out. I think the High Priestess is a very striking visual. This woman completely consumed by stone and barely even human anymore. She considers herself blessed by the gods, but it's just… wrong. This should not happen to someone. That's what makes this such a striking visual, because she's still alive, yet resembles the corpses of Pompeii, those people famously smothered in volcanic stone and ash, fossilised and long dead, and in some cases caught polishing the one-eyed gopher. But she's like this even before the eruption, and she's still alive. It furthers this idea of monstrous interference, and this is confirmed when she reveals a pyroval is growing inside her. She's becoming one of them, and it's speaking through her, them having crashed into the volcano thousands of years ago. It's quite a typical Doctor Who plot, but I think it being combined with Pompeii and Vesuvius makes it a lot stronger and more remarkable. The air is going to fill with ash and rocks, tons and tons of it. This whole town is going to get Previous historical episodes of modern Doctor Who had been mainly famous figure based, or exploring things going completely wrong and off script. Like a werewolf trying to bite Queen Victoria, or witches trying to take over the world through a Shakespearean play. However, this is the first time the Doctor is put in the position of being in a time and place where nothing can change. This is a very significant time in history, and the Doctor just has to leave. Saving people or warning them will be catastrophic. It's good for showing the realities of time travel, how even the Doctor has to draw the line at certain points. Donna, who is the audience surrogate, brings up that they can and should warn people about the eruption, but the Doctor rightfully understands that there's nothing they can do. They can't interfere because of how destructive that would be. Much like the mythology, this is a great through line for the story, because it explores that reality of travelling through time, how you have to just be a passenger and an observer, you can't change anything too drastic. It's a very powerful emotional dilemma to go through, because it's easy to sit there on your sofa with your bowl of popcorn and say, oh, they should just leave. But Donna is really there, seeing firsthand all of these innocent people who are about to die. This isn't something you can easily walk away from. Everyone would feel that urge to want to save people from their inevitable destruction, so it shows a good contrast between her and the Doctor. She sees the human element, being face to face and wanting to rescue this family from their coming destruction. The contrast creates tension between her and the Doctor because of their different views on the universe. To the Doctor, these are just specs, but to Donna, they're all humans. Living, breathing humans with their own lives, their own goals and aspirations. He might be able to turn away and 
and fly off without looking back, but Donna has that personal connection with the human world, so understands that she has to do something. But that's what you do, you're the doctor, you save people. Not this time, Pompeii is a fixed point in history, what happens happens, there is no stopping it. In previous episodes, like Father's Day, the doctor explained his theory of fixed points in time, moments that absolutely have to happen and cannot be altered, otherwise it will fracture the timeline and the universe as a whole. I mean, look no further than the Chimes of Midnight to see how wild things can get when the doctor meddles with fixed points. I like that Donna questions how the doctor knows what's fixed and what's in flux, because he saved the world from Ragnos, so what makes that different to Vesuvius? This is a good question because it once again delves into that audience questioning, just like the beginning of the episode did with the TARDIS and the translation abilities. One of the first things a viewer would say is, well why can't he change these events if the Doctor does so much stuff like it on a daily basis? Obviously we know the Doctor can't dramatically change real world events, this isn't a Tarantino movie after all, but this is the first time we get a proper explanation of his fixed time theory. I think his explanation ties back to episodes like Rose and the passing of the ways, where the Doctor explained how they see all of time at once, everything that was, everything that is, and everything it will ever be. I think the Doctor is right to call this ability a burden, because they have to live all their lives knowing the number of people they can't save, knowing all of these things happen and there's nothing they can do to fix it. It explains why the Doctor finds it so easy to walk away, because they're so used to it. At one point the Doctor would have been like Donna, determined to undo these horrors and save lives, but then reality got beaten into them over the years and they had to live with this understanding that they can't do it, they can't change these fixed points. Fixed points are the Doctor's own theory, so it shows how blunted they are to these catastrophic losses of life. It's all just a theory now because the rawness of Donna's emotional turmoil is long gone. They're numbers to him and Donna calls him out on this, which is great for showing those two sides of the dilemma, how difficult this decision really is and how they both see it in such drastically different ways. The Doctor and Donna then find themselves in the heart of the mountain, where the Paravals are living, with Lucius monologuing the villain's plan. You'd think they'd learn, right? When has a villain ever recounted their plan in excruciating detail and won? However, it serves as a good way to show the Paravals' motivations, wanting to reshape the Earth into a new homeworld after losing their actual home, much like the Adipose breeding planet was mysteriously lost as well. It's another good way of setting up the finale of the series, since the planet has been taken into the Medusa Cascade party as well. The Doctor then realises exactly what he's dealing with. If he changes the Paravals' power systems, Pompeii erupts. If he doesn't, they take over the world and burn it to rebuild it in their image. It's no longer just a case of not interrupting history. He has to be the one to pull the switch and condemn all of these people's lives. I think this is the 10th Doctor's version of the iconic Do I Have the Right scene from Genesis of the Daleks. He's faced with this huge, universe-altering decision and he has to do it. It's his decision and his responsibility, no one else's. This is a scene that has always been highly praised and it's obvious why. David Tennant and Catherine Tate do a great job showing their strong emotional struggles during this moment. Donna finally understands that this is the Doctor's life, these are the realities of having this power to travel through time. Even though the Doctor bounds around in their little blue box saving lives and stopping the bad guys, the downside is that they have to put themselves in these positions, becoming the person to make these impossible decisions. It is so powerful because it shows this reality and Donna can actually see the Doctor's pain now. She thought it was so simple, a choice he could easily make, but now she understands why it's such a tough choice, because you can't save everyone. No matter what the Doctor does, they're always dooming someone to death, so you can understand why they become blunt and desensitised by this lifestyle to the extent that they see deaths as numbers, especially because the Doctor had to destroy all the Time Laws at the end of the Time War. So the Tenth Doctor is living a constant reminder of that mass genocide he still believes he committed. Push this lever and it's over. 20,000 people. Then together the Doctor and Donna push the button, dooming Pompeii to save the world, giving us reaction shots of everyone we met along the way, the soothsayers suddenly seeing the future and the mass death about to unfold. It is such a dramatic climax, scored so incredibly well by Murray Gold, adding such frantic energy and panic to the eruption. The crowd shots are utilised really well because Donna once again has to face the human element, seeing all these people and children, unable to save any of them as the skies turn black and the volcano consumes 
claims all. She can't convince anyone to escape. It's too late and nobody is listening to her. The Doctor even forces her to walk away from Cacilius and his cowering family. There's nothing she can do, so you can understand why it causes her such turmoil. This leads to that incredible scene in the TARDIS as she begs him to go back. I like these kinds of dramatic moments of conflict between the Doctor and the Companion, because it's always a way of showing how out of touch the Doctor is with humanity, since the Companion is in that audience surrogate position. The scene draws those parallels between Pompeii and Gallifrey, because the Doctor wishes he could go back and save his people, but he can't, so he also can't save the people of Pompeii either. He has to live with the consequences of his actions, knowing it's not fair to leave, but having no other choice. I think David Tennant is once again brilliant here, showing that pain and forced ignorance because he's almost trying to shut himself out, to run away from the death he's caused. He would go back if he could, but he has to force himself to leave. That's why Donna is there, because she's the one to change his mind. She's the one to convince him to save just one family. I think the scene is quite similar to the end of the massacre, where Stephen argues with the Doctor for walking away and leaving the supporting characters of the story to die in the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. In that episode, the Doctor leaves as soon as he realises where and when they are, causing Stephen to quit the TARDIS in disgust for this act of running away. Here, the Doctor is in a similar situation, but but because he now carries that pain of the Time War, Donna is able to convince him to go about it differently and return for Cacilius. Also, props for Catherine Tate for ugly crying. I always appreciate it when actors do a good old ugly cry. You really understand Donna's turmoil here because this would obviously weigh so hard on her conscience and tear her apart knowing she was responsible for this. So it's another great piece of acting by both Tennant and Tate, properly showing the trauma they're going through after sentencing 20,000 people to die like this, regardless of why they had to do it. Then, as Cacilius and his family huddle, prepared for their death, the TARDIS triumphantly arrives to the sound of the Doctor Forever. This moment always makes me choke up a little bit because it's so powerful. It encapsulates exactly what the Doctor and the TARDIS are all about. Hope. That sound, that unremarkable blue box, it's a beacon of hope, a beacon of life. It tells you that everything will be okay, there's someone looking out for you even when you're facing death. It's something to believe in, so I think it's just a great moment. The Doctor offering out his hand to save these people after fighting so hard to walk away from them. I know a lot of people heavily dislike the deification of the Doctor, but moments like these are what makes it a very good narrative to explore. He appears with a white shining light behind him and resembles a new hope for Cacilius because they believed in all these gods who have now abandoned them, but not the Doctor. It also continues to lead the Doctor down that Time Lord Victorious path because this is him breaking his main rule of not interfering with fixed points. Even though these are just four unremarkable people, that's still four less dead people in the eruption. He has changed history, even if it is slight. It's a big deal because of this huge deviation. This moment is what shows him he's capable of going against fixed points in time, because in Waters of Mars, he takes the next step and completely changes things. In that, he's not just saving four people from a 20,000 death toll, but directly interfering and saving a person who had to die for the timeline to continue, essentially serving as him preventing Pompeii because the implications are so similar. I just think this moment to cap off fires of Pompeii is so heroic and memorable because of every aspect of it. It's the perfect way to end the story, showing that even if he is in this lose-lose scenario, there are still small victories to be had, along with setting up those character beats at the end of the 10th Doctor's life. I know they've done this sort of thing before. In small ways, say some little people. After all the chaos and the emotional struggles, the Doctor and the family overlook the destruction, and he assures them that people will remember, they will find Pompeii again. It's another powerful moment because they're seeing the complete obliteration of their home, their entire way of life. This was everything they knew, everything they had, and now it's gone, lost to the flames. I think it again draws those parallels to the Doctor because it makes the family like him. They see their home consumed by great fire, their people perishing as they watch on, knowing all they're losing and that this will haunt them forever, knowing that they are the last survivors of this great tragedy. It's like how the Doctor watched as Gallifrey burned and the Master burned, becoming the last of his kind, but unlike Pompeii, they won't be remembered. He's the only one that carries their name, he's their only way of surviving. Cacilius and his family can see what the Doctor has saved them from, so it's not surprising that they begin to see him as a god. This mysterious man who popped into their life so briefly and took them into his impossible box, saving them and giving them a new lease of life. 
It says so much about the Doctor that this is the kind of impact they can have on people. In the final scene, we see how they've improved so much, in a better place, on the verge of being rich and Quintus having straightened himself out to become a Doctor. They know how lucky they are to be alive, so they're doing their best to make the most of their second chance at life, wanting to make the Doctor proud for saving them. It's kind of like Mr. Copper in Voyage of the Damned. Then there's that fantastic last moment of Quintus praying to the Doctor and Donna, who are their new household gods. As I said, their gods betrayed them and abandoned them, but the Doctor rescued them from their fate, so it's no surprise that they put him on this pedestal and see him this way. Also, just as a side note, Cochilius asks for a beetle brooch. My overly analytical brain wants to say that's a subtle hint towards the time beetle in turn left, but I highly doubt it. After all, the Egyptians do love a scallop. The Fires of Pompeii is an incredible episode that shows exactly what Doctor Who is capable of doing with its genre. When you have a time machine, it will always be inevitable to find yourself in a situation like this, facing a huge moment in history you have no control over and can't alter. It's a very difficult narrative to pull off, but this episode excels at it. It's one of the best examples of how an alien presence can create a good narrative in a historical episode, with the Pyroviles serving as a very good vehicle for the moral dilemma. I'll be saying it a lot in these Series 4 reviews, but David Tennant and Catherine Tate are phenomenal in this episode, both of them pulling out performances that accentuate their pain and moral agony throughout, with Donna specifically moving away from the comically sarcastic and confrontational character she was in The Runaway Bride, and showing a real emotional and relatable underside. I've seen people criticise the supporting cast for being one-dimensional, and I can understand why, but the episode does just enough to make these characters relatable and sympathetic, because it's not really about them, but it still makes them solid characters you don't want to see die. Some people even dared to criticise Peter Capaldi for being too camp, but come on, it's the Russell T Davies era and it's Peter Capaldi, just enjoy them. I remember enjoying Fires of Pompeii every time I watched it, but I was completely blown away this time, so I would put it at a solid A tier on the Series 4 tier list. Everything comes together so well to form a really heart-wrenching and dramatic episode that deals with some really mature and existential themes, thanks to the setting of this doomed city. The music is incredible, the set design on point, the jokes are brilliantly written and delivered, and I thought the pacing was just right, since it gave us plenty of those jokes, but also plenty of slow moments to explore the realities of the Doctor's difficult lifestyle. Parts of the episode were a bit cliche and had been done before, but I think the emotional backbone of the story makes up for it. The Fires of Pompeii has always been a fan favourite, and it definitely deserves that reputation. Dare I say, it's... Modern art! And I'd like to give an extra special thank you to my gold level patrons, Daniel Shillito, John, Mark Hippolgai Taylor, and Stephanie Never Miller. Thank you a lot for your support.